What is the blockchain? Blockchain is basically a property registration system for data, for information. And that's what it is. Now that has a huge potential, it's a really big deal. Here now we're gonna look into more detail exactly how that works and what it implies. So you can put whatever data here and this data could be, well, I could put here $5 and I have $5 here that I usually hold on with my fist and I have these $5 or I can just put in here, well, $5 or five Bitcoins or five Ethereum or whatever you want. And then you register it here. You can also put something else in there, NFTs and so forth. But how does that actually work? How do we go from whatever we put in here that we own to the blockchain and how does it register it? Well, let's start again how to think about it. What I want to walk through here with you now in this little spiel is I want to set up a really good property registration system. Let's think about all the things we need and then we go step by step through that and try to implement it and make it really good and make it a really good one so we invent our own and when we think like we have the best one that we can have, it turns out, voila, at that point you will also understand what the blockchain really is because that's what it is. It's a really good property registration system. Okay, so let's think about what it means to have property. Well, there's good old me and I have something so I get bigger. My ego gets bigger that motivates me. Property system are incentive mechanisms to get me going, to expand my ego, to increase my fitness by becoming bigger. And I have something now here that makes me bigger. Now, usually I have to hold on to that in my fist. So back in the Wild West, I better didn't let go of my sack of gold. So here I have it, my $5 and, and I hold on to them because where could I put them? oh, I could put them in a bank and then I need some kind of information storage and then I have my $5 in the bank. I don't need to have them on my body all the time. So I go and take them out of the bank again. So I need some kind of information system. That's called an information record, basically a, a ledger. Then there is you who has something too. And when we trade, and I give something to you, you become bigger, I become smaller, then we need to know who is who. So you don't talk in my name and I don't talk in your name because then I would say like, hey, yeah, you gave that to me. Remember? <laughs> remember, like between siblings, remember you gave that to me? It's like, no, I never gave that to you. But, you know, that's how it is. Uh, so you have to know who is who and you really have to certify who, who you are. And then we have to know how that happens in time. So there needs to be some kind of time, time stamp. And that's why we chain this record together. That's where the term chain comes from. And that verifies when things happened. And then we make it a really good one. And we also do this entire thing without a trusted third party. Because for now, we put these certificate of ownerships to a trusted third party like a bank. For example, and my $5 when they're at the bank, the bank keeps, keeps them on their ledger. On, on their record, and then I can get them back. But hopefully the bank is still there when I go there the next day, because that's not trusted, then you know they have my certificate of ownership. So what we do here, we do that without a trusted third party. How do we do that? Well, we make many copies. So if even one of them is not there anymore, let's say the one custodian goes, bankrupt, like it would be the bank, we have many copies of it. So you would have to take out all the copies in order to do that. And, and there are many copies, for example, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, you could download that on your smartphone and have the entire Bitcoin blockchain on your smartphone and then you have a copy of it. So it's not really, it's not really a big, big thing to have a copy of that. That's, that's why it's so redundant and so difficult to destroy. So we're going to walk through these four characteristics now for uh, one by one. The information record, the verify who, the verify when it happens, which is important not to do shenanigans, and then how can we do all of that without a trusted third party. Okay, let's get going. So first we need an information record, a ledger, a good old ledger. That's what ledgers look like. That's the interdepartmental mail, even like... <laughs> Not in my university. So in my life, I worked for the United Nations and for the University of California, the world's most comprehensive public university, the two biggest bureaucracy on planet Earth. You see these things a lot. That's what we still do. <laughs> be that in the United Nations or, or be that in, in the world's uh, most comprehensive public university. Uh, that is, that's what we still have ledgers for. You go you know, to the library, to the mail, to 
whatever the the banks traditionally that's how they would do that but basically we need a database and that database tells us that i have something and you have something and then i got something and you have nothing and we just need to write that down so that's a kind of database that we need that's why they call it a ledger so a ledger is basically that that registry second what do we need well we need to verify who why is that important you need to really we need to respect that you is really also you because if there's just a ledger i could go in and write there hey you just gave me a hundred and he was like no you know i didn't sign that like i didn't sign off on that no i didn't give you a hundred i did not i did so we need to verify that did i say that in your name or did you say that so you need some kind of verification you need to sign off on that so we do that with a signature a digital signature and there you really verify that you is you and me and me because you have this unique signature. Now, digital signatures, that goes back to the 1970s, such cutting edge blockchain, right? It's a ledger of digital signatures. That is a pretty old technology, actually. Len Edelman has worked on that. That is, was one of my mentors. He taught me at the beginning of what algorithms are. So blame him for, for me talking so much about algorithms. So he developed that, co-developed it with others back in the 1970s, 1978. And digital signatures are, are still extremely important and powerful. So only you can produce your signature, right? So you give a signature on something, only you can produce it. Well, except the signature of your mom that you put on your high school, whatever absence notice. No, I'm just kidding. But supposedly only, you know, your mom can write her signatures and you can only write your signatures. That also shows you that analog signatures are actually not, not, not so safe. Digital signatures are much safer. Additionally, because additionally that only you can produce it and only you can produce it with a password. You have a long password. Imagine you have 24 passwords and with that, you can produce, once you have them, your digital signature gets produced. That's much more secure than trying to trace somebody else's, right? Try to break these 24 passwords. But additionally, it cannot be reused on another message. And that's very powerful. On, and on a paper signature, for example, you sign at the bottom and then, you know, you could, you could change something in the document on top. The signature will still be there. Try to do that with a digital signature. It wouldn't work. So it's only valid if your unique sign goes with this specific document, if I would change anything in the document, for example, check that out, now it became invalid. You see what happened? What happened here? You see what happens? I just removed the dot of the E. And even that already makes the digital signature invalid because you changed something in the document. So it's actually, it's much better than an analog signature, digital signatures. And how you do that, you encrypt it, you have a private key, that's your 20, whatever, I just say 24 passwords, then you encrypt it with that, you write your signature, and then somebody else can decrypt it, and that's a public key, so everybody then can read it, if they have the permission to read it, then they can read, and they can publicly, I can give you my public key, so say, hey, you can read the document that I just signed, I don't give you my private key, because then you could sign it. See, that's the difference. It can also go the other way around. Uh, I could say, hey, do you want something? I send you, you know, the public key, and then you can, with your uh, private key, accept it or not. So I cannot accept it for you. You can only accept it. Well, that has to do with encryption and decryption. And that actually, the entire crypto talk of the crypto and the crypto, it has to do with that. It's it's a 1970s technology that's encrypted and decrypted. And that's what's actually encrypted in crypto. The rest has to do with a hash function. And we will talk about that in a little bit. The hash function is, is much more important in blockchain actually than digital signatures. But at the core, the blockchain is a ledger of digital signatures. That's what it is. It's an information record that has digital signatures where different, the information record tracks what you have and the digital signatures tracks who has it. And you have to put your digital signature in order to certify that yes, you have it. So that's that's that. Now, we also have to verify when, and uh, that has to do with the timestamps and that eventually we make it a chain. And with that, we verify it when. That has to do, that was very important even for Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the, who wrote the white paper of, for Bitcoin, because it has to do with this double spending problem. So you need to know when things happen. For example, if you already spend the 100 coins, then you cannot spend them again. 
So we need to verify when you spend them. Because they say like, oh, no, no, I will spend them. And like, hey, no, wait, you already did. Oh, no, I did. Oh, you gave it to me. So it's uh, if you want to have a, a registration there that manages property, it's important to have a clear record in time. And many people say that in order to not have this confusion, and many people see that as the birth of the blockchain in 1991. Okay, so we advanced quite a bit from the 1970s to the 1990s. That's the famous Harbour and Stornetta paper that introduced how to timestamp a digital document. And they actually said it's for intellectually property. So for example, in intellectually property matters, uh, it is sometimes crucial to verify the date an inventor first put in writing a patentable idea in order to establish its precedence over competing claims. So they already worked on a property registration system. So that was the, the motivation of Harbour and Stonetta. And many people say that's the birth of the blockchain. Now, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, that came in 2008. So that is still a long time off. Now we are the 1970s and 1990s. We already have the fundaments of uh, the foundations of property registration system. So how they say they do it is, well, we, we chain it together, basically. That's why we timestamp it. We put our timestamp on it. And then we chain it together. And how they do that is that you basically include the previous block in the later block. So you, that's how you chain it together. So the timestamp zero says, for example, I have something and you have nothing. And then the timestamp one says, I gave you something, but it includes the previous block. So it's more like these Russian Matryoshka dolls where you have a, a bigger one, a smaller one inside a bigger one. So we build a bigger one around it and we include the previous one. And we build a bigger one around it and include the previous one. So you always in each block actually have all the previous blocks in there, so to speak. So how that's you can think about it, that's why it becomes a chain. So then the, the block number two here includes the previous two blocks and so forth. And that's why it's called a block chain, a block chain, a block chain. And that's that's basically what it is. The, a better way to think about this chain is actually, as I explained before, like these Russian Matryoshka dolls. So you start with this and then you build a bigger one around it and you include the previous one. And then you build a bigger one around it and you include the previous one. They build a, a, and so forth. Now, if I change something on a previous post, right? So I have this post here first and then I build the ones around it and somebody says, hey, let's go back to that. Let's change the past. I think like, I think you never gave me that, that thing that you say you gave me, right? And they change it something here, then the entire blockchain sounds the alarm. And you can actually go back and see what that happened. That's why the blockchain is an immutable pass. Well, immutable. If, if we all agree to change it, we can all agree to change it. We can also all agree to call green purple from now on. And if we would all call green purple from now on, that's what it would be. But Otherwise, you just say green is green and purple is purple, and that's just that. So if you change anything in this entire track record, the alarm will sound and will say, hey, that is something that is not okay. That's not there anymore. So you, it, that's what makes it immutable for all practical purposes. And you do that with a hash. And we will talk much more about uh, hash functions and hash values. But what is stored on the blockchain is basically only this hash value. So this is SHA-256. And here I write this data, as I said, I can write anything, any data I want on the blockchain, but then what it does, it hashes it. So now when you see, what did I do here? So you see how this entire hash function changed now? So this entire thing changed, why? Well, same idea, I just changed this little dot here. And just by changing this little dot, the entire hash function changes here. Uh, and that is the, that's the reason that it is basically, you go from one way you hash it, but it's infeasible to go backwards. So you cannot change it because the entire hash function changes uh, completely. In the next video, we will talk much more about hash functions because they're very important. But if you get that, that's basically it. It's a one-way function. So you can take everything in here. You could take the Constitution of the United States or a 300-page novel or a, a, a video that has a lot of gigabytes, for example. And then you create this hash function that is uh, always the same size. That's why we can actually expect how fast the blockchain will grow because we only put this here on the blockchain. And then we, we link them together in time. And we will talk about that more in the next session when we talk uh, about, uh, about hash functions, how we link them together. We link these hash functions together, basically. So for now, we have a chained ledger of timestamped digital 
signatures. Now, in order to make it a really innovative property registration system, we want to do it without the need for a trusted third party. So we don't have a trusted third party watch over that. In blockchain lingo, they talk about a trustless system. <laughs> sounds a little funny because it sounds like don't trust it, don't trust crypto, it's trustless. But what it, this way, it, how that is that word is used is there's no need for a trusted third party. That's why there's no need for trust. Yes, there's no need to have trust in anybody because the algorithm just executes what it executes. So that's just that. There is no need to trust a human in this sense. At least not to trust a human in order to see what you put on the block, but what is in the blockchain. You don't need a human to trust that. And that's very different from the past. For example, Mark Zuckerberg, the main stakeholder of Facebook and Meta, well, has the authority to change whatever is on the Facebook server, right? He, he has that. He has that Facebook server. So, you know, we got to trust him. There is some level of trust there. However, on the blockchain, you don't need to trust anyone, not Mark Zuckerberg or nobody else, because it's there's no need for trust. That's, that's what this argument is. Now, it's not completely true as a social scientist, I have to say, you still need trust in order to somebody to execute that. Just because it's written on the blockchain, I mean, who cares? You know, like, you need to trust the police, you need to trust some judge, you need to trust. So it's like, who executes it in the real world? You still need trust in the world. The blockchain will not get rid of human trust. But the question of what's on the blockchain, in the same sense, if you compare it to the server with Mark Zuckerberg, there we have to trust Mark Zuckerberg that he didn't manipulate his server that we all access when we access Facebook and Instagram. Now, here, we don't have to trust no one. It's just that's on the blockchain. So that's the argument um, of the trustless uh, system. So the first idea uh, is to make it um, public. So if we have it public, we have many eyes on it. And that's what Nakamoto said in the Bitcoin white paper. Why, why don't we just make it public? And then, you know, we can all look at it. And so in order to make it public, the custom has become that we don't put our real names on it. And there's no need to put your real name on it. You can have a pseudonym. You can have pseudonym one and you can have alias, whatever. You can have words that stand for you, artist names. You don't need to put your real name on it because it's public. So there's still some privacy here. So the blockchain is not anonymous. It is not. It is pseudonymous. Anonymous, right? So there's a pseudonym. We don't know who owns this wallet. For example, let's imagine there would be a blockchain called Dogecoin and it has a big wallet with a lot of Dogecoins in them. And we do not know who owns this wallet, but this wallet is public. Everybody can see what goes in and out of this wallet. And we can only guess. So this wallet has the pseudonym Dogefather just to give it a popular name. And we don't know what it is, but then it turns out, oh, it's Elon Musk. Oh yeah, but from now on, we know that's Elon Musk's wallet. And whenever he transferred something out of it, we can all see it. I mean, the wallet has always been public. We just didn't know, well, now we know. <laughs> we suspect who's the Doge father. And that's not the name of the wallet. That's just what the media uses. But you know, this is an historical example of a very early cryptocurrency, the Dogecoin, that, that was a big mystery. And that was, so you don't know. But now that you know, everybody can see what's this transacted. We still know Satoshi Nakamoto's first Bitcoin wallet. And if something would move from there, people would get very nervous because that would mean that Satoshi Nakamoto is still alive. But under now, nothing has moved, but we know the wallet, it's, it's public, but there's a pseudonym on it. In this case, the pseudonym is Satoshi Nakamoto, which is probably not a real name. We, for all that we know, we don't know. So we make it public and now we actually, the public is not required. Actually, the better term is it's distributed because it doesn't really have to be public. Chase Manhattan Bank, for example, one of the biggest banks that we have, uh, uses the blockchain a lot, but it uses it in a private way. You, you don't see what's on the Chase Manhattan Bank blockchain. They use blockchain in their back office to do, to do their accounting too, but it's not a public blockchain, not like the public blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, which everybody can see every wallet and see what's going on there. No, it's a private blockchain, but it's the, the key here, what Nakamoto was going at, is that it's distributed, that we have many different copies of it. Actually, what I said right now, there are many copies of it, is not really correct, because there is no it. There is no copy and no original. There are just a lot of parallel copies of the blockchain. And you can download the entire Bitcoin blockchain and save it on your smartphone. 
right now and you have a copy too and that's not less valid than any other copy of the bitcoin blockchain that's out there so that's just that okay so now we have a distributed chained ledger of timestamp digital signatures mm -hmm. now the question is when we now add something to the ledger we add something additional to it what do we add on it because i could now say for example pseudonym one gave something but then the other guy says that also has a copy of the blockchain on their on their smartphone saying no elias two gave something and they say no no i think it was pseudonym one that's it like i think he gave some no she gave something I mean, so how do we agree on writing the next block on the blockchain and that now finally that is where the famous Bitcoin paper comes in. So we went from the 1970s to the 1990s, and finally we're in 2008. That is Satoshi Nakamoto's, the first up modern application. And what this paper basically solved is that. It's the consensus algorithm. How do we put ourselves in agreement of putting something else next on the blockchain? Now, there are as many ways we can agree on something as there are ways to disagree on something. And notoriously, there are many ways we can disagree. And hence, there are many different ways we can pursue to agree on something. So there are many different consensus algorithms out there. But we have to find some agreement to see like, since this, there's no original, no copy of all these different copies of the blockchain, what do we put on to it next? So there needs to be some kind of consensus recipe, a recipe for a consensus algorithm, basically. So let's read the Bitcoin white paper ourselves a little bit. And I invite you to read it. It's actually very readable. It's not, not too technical, actually. What did Nakamoto say? How did Nakamoto, they, we don't know who it is, solve the consensus algorithm problem? Well, they started with saying, digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. The double spending was this idea that you have money in your wallet, but you already spend it. So why do you offer me? It's like the, the check bounces. It's that idea. That's the idea of double spending. If you already spend it, then you know somebody has to look into your wallet. So in banking, the bank does that. It says, no, the check bounces. The $100 are gone already. So you cannot take more out. So how do we do that if we don't have a bank to check on what's actually in the wallet? Well, we make, let's see what I say. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. Make it distributed. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work. So that's this consensus algorithm. It's their consensus algorithm. Sorry, I fall into myself. We do not know what Nakamoto is, right? Forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So what is this proof of work? Well, it has to do with the miners. That's why you mine Bitcoins. And proof of work is really, it's a lot of work that you have to do. And basically what you do here is, and I, I will go much deeper into that in the next video when we talk about hashing, but the idea is you do a lot of work and, and you look for something uh, and you mine for it. So for example, I take a little coin and I say, here I have a coin and I mark it. And I say, I have this coin and I fly over the Rocky Mountains and I draw or over the Alps mountain range and I drop this coin there and you guys go look for it. And you are standing there with your shovel and saying, okay, let's look for this one coin that he dropped in the Rocky Mountains. Well, good luck to look for it. It's still easier to look for that than to look for what Bitcoin miners are looking for. Really, trust me. It's very difficult to find that. But that's basically it. They mine, they really look for this, you know, for this grain of gold, which is very unique. Once you find it, it's very easy to verify. So let's say somebody goes out in the Rocky Mountains and like, oh, I have it. No, are you sure? Show us. But once anybody found it, it's very easy to verify. Oh yeah, that's it. So we all agree. Oh, you found it. Okay. We give you, we give you something. We give you some reward because you're the one who found it. Clap, clap, clap. We give you some Bitcoins in that case. And then we all write the next block onto it. So that's the proof of work. The amount of work that you have to do is very energy intensive. Same as when you run around the Rocky Mountains, you will expend a lot of energy. And when you compute the Bitcoin mining, uses a lot of energy. And so you would have to redo all of that. And many do that in parallel. And it's, it's just like, it's, it's not worth it. So it, it wouldn't calculate if you, if you want to redo all of the history of Bitcoin. So that is kind of like you basically, Nakamoto says in his paper, they basically, they vote with their CPUs. That's what they do. Now, that contrasts with proof of stake. So with proof of stake, we don't say go out and do work. 
And by that, you verify that you really have a stake into this game and you really did the work and you looked into it. We play all this game of looking for the you know, grain of gold in the Rocky Mountains. Here it is more like, well, just put the stakes up. It's like playing poker. It's like, you want to write the next block on the Bitcoin blockchain? Well, then put your money where your mouth is and you move all the chips to the center of the table and you stake them. Now you write the next block on the blockchain. And if we all watch you, it's distributed, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And if you do something funky there, your blocks, your, your stakes, they will be slashed. Basically, we take them and you lose all of them. Now, you have to put big mountains of chips in the middle if you want to play that game with, with these guys there. But that's what they do. Actually, they take, create staking pools. So you give other people, use, and because you need such big amounts, but then you put them on there and then you basically vouch for doing the right thing, doing the truth by having your stakes on the table. And then if you did the right thing, well, you get a reward. And that's also assigned with some random function. So that's the two most common. And these are called validators because we validate after you put your chips in the middle, we validate if you did the right thing. So they are miners and validators. But these are not the only two consensus algorithms. There are many different consensus algorithms out there. As I said, there are no, so many ways we can agree as we can disagree. And there's a lot of innovation still going on. Now, this one here is very energy efficient. Proof of stake is much more energy efficient than proof of work. And we will talk more about that in the next video. But so these, if you hear this, Bitcoin mining, proof of work, stake, validator, staking, and so forth, this has to do with how we put ourselves into agreement of what is the next block that we write onto the blockchain. All right, voila, that's it. So what does it mean to have property? Well, there is a ledger, an information record that I have something. That's the information record that is verified that really you are really the one who signs off on having given something or of having something. So we do that with digital signatures. It verifies who is who. Then we timestamp that, that has to do with the double spending problem, and we chain it together so we can actually verify when things happened. So nobody can say like, oh, no, 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 I already gave that to you. I gave, no, like we know what happened when. So because we know what, the information record, when it happened and who did it. So that's the, the three most important ingredients that we need for property registration system. And now we said we want to make it a good one. We do not need a trusted third party. We don't need trust for anybody who is the custodian of our information. We do that among ourselves and we do that by having many copies and we agree on them to have these many copies. So we have one record of the past, an immutable one record of the past. And once we agree on that, then we have this distributed ledger that is very difficult to eliminate. It, the idea of this is, is very similar to why we invented the internet. The internet was invented because during the Cold War, the United States military was afraid, what if somebody would destroy our communication system? So let's create a distributed internet, a net between the nets, so no Cold War attack could take out our communication system because the package can still go around another way. The same idea, what the internet was for communication, the blockchain is for storage. So that's the, that's the order of magnitude of, that's why the blockchain is such a big deal. Because if you delete one of these copies, the other copies will still be there. And it's extremely difficult to catch them all. So you can just make new copies again. So you basically cannot take it out. So that's why it is such a big deal to have this mechanism of the no trusted third party. Again, we will still need, we will not be in a trustless society. We'll still need trust in our society because somebody needs to execute it and you still need humans to act on this information record. I mean, this is just an information record. That's what it is. But as it comes to a property registration system, that's the best I've come across with. And it's so good that it can even register the property of information itself. It's an information system that allows to have property on information. And that is a big potential to really unleash the true power of the digital age.